Uh, we are going through the Gospel of John here at Calvary. We have, um, we, we've covered a lot of ground, and where we are at this point as we're going through the Gospel of John is we are in the last evening that uh, Jesus spent on earth with his disciples just before he was crucified. And so this is, uh, we're dropping in here in the middle of what we call the farewell discourse, his last words uh, of instruction for his disciples. And so turn with me, if you would, to uh, the end of John 14. Uh, the kids can be dismissed for children's worship at this point if they haven't already gone out, uh, four years old through first grade. So John chapter 14, we're picking up at verse 28, and we're going to read into, verse, uh, into chapter 15, verse 15. Hear the word of our Lord Jesus Christ, starting at John 14, verse 28. You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. <clears throat> I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples." As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. This is the word of the Lord. Oh Lord Jesus, you are the vine. We are but the branches. Work within us by the power of of your word and spirit, your resurrection life, that we might bear fruit in our lives. We pray in your matchless name, amen. You are a branch. It may not sound like the most exciting thing in the world, right? But, but really, this is one of the most important things for you to know if you're going to be what God has created you to be. You are a branch. And the reason that this is one of the most important things for you to know is because whether you realize it or not, what you need more than anything else is to be rooted in something. If you are a branch, you cannot survive on your own. And you need something else to give you life, to give you meaning, to give you purpose. You need it to be rooted in something if you are not going to wither and die. The, you are a branch, and the only question is, where are you planted? And what kind of fruit are you producing? Why does Jesus want you to know this? He, he tells you, in verse 11. And it's amazing. This is one of the things that struck me most. You know, this is a passage that's very meaningful to me, John chapter 15. But when I, when I was reflecting on it this week, this, this really hit me the most. Verse 11, he tells you the purpose for which he's saying these things, doesn't he? That your joy may be full. 
I, I say these things to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Why do you need to know this in order for the joy of Jesus to be in you? Because, well, if you're like me, you know, you think about your life, you think about the things that you're doing, the things that are going on around you, if you think about where you are and you're just sort of focused on yourself, you sort of feel at times like you're just a branch sitting off in a field somewhere with nothing else is around, and it's like, how in the world did I get here? What, what is God doing here in my life? What, what is going on in these situations, in these circumstances? Is there any meaning? Is there any purpose to all of this stuff? Jesus is saying these things to you in John chapter 4. 15, so that your joy may be full with this vision that whatever is going on in your life and wherever you're fi you find yourself, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you abide in Jesus, that God is at work to bring about his purposes so that you can bear fruit for him. So three things I want to highlight for us as we work our way through this text. Uh, first, the vine and the vine dresser. Second, the branches. Third, the fruit. The vine and the vine dresser, the branches, the fruit. First, the vine and the vine dresser. Jesus says, I am the vine and my father is the vine dresser. Now, if you were in Sunday school this morning, you heard a great message that Pete Tyson gave us about Christ and pop culture. And one of the things that he reminded us in Sunday school of was that the Bible is a story, right? It's a narrative. And so what is the story that is sitting behind this metaphor, this image that Jesus gave? gives us here about the vine, the vine dresser, the branches, and the fruit. It actually goes back to the very, very beginning. God created humanity, what? Why? In his image, Genesis 1.27, he blessed them and he said to them, what? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So fruitfulness is inherent to our creation as human beings. It's inherent to our purpose that we would go and that we would bear fruit in the world. Fruitfulness is also the purpose for which God called Israel out of Egypt. And so this theme, right, of, the, of, of God as the vine dresser and Israel as the vine that he planted, it really runs throughout the Old Testament. Um, and Jesus, you need to see, he's certainly picking up on that theme when he, when, he, when, he, when he uses this image here in John chapter 15. We heard a passage about this earlier, didn't we? Psalm 80. Psalm 80 said, right in verse 8, you brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it, right? So you, you get this picture, sort of Israel is in bondage in Egypt the Lord looks down upon, uh, upon the land of Egypt and sees there his, his little vine, right? Uh, and, and this vine is, is withering and dying because of the oppression of its surroundings. And what does he do? He, he plucks up this little vine that he loves, and he takes it to another land, that has good soil, a good land flowing with milk and honey. And he clears the ground, right? He drives out the nations. He clears away the things that would threaten his vine. And he plants the vine in that land. Why? So that they would bear fruit for his glory. So that they, in the words of Genesis chapter 12, as God said to Abraham, why, right, why did God call out Abraham? That he, would, that he would become a multitude of people and that the nations of the earth would be blessed through his offspring. That fruitfulness that Israel was created to bear is why the Lord put them there in the promised land. They were to bear fruit and to bless the people around them. But what happened? By the way, it's not just Psalm 80. Isaiah 15, uh, Isaiah 5, Ezekiel 15, Ezekiel 17. There are lots of other passages that tell this story this way. What happened? Over time, it became clear Israel was not going to bear the fruit that God was looking for, it, for from it. This vine wasn't going to bear fruit. And so Isaiah 5 says, the, the Lord speaking says, What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done for it? And then he says, I'm going to let it be plucked up and dispersed. 
And so after years of, and years, generations and generations of, of the, the vine dresser's loving care, right, cultivating, pruning, watering his vine, the Lord uprooted this vine and took it out of the land that he had planted it in and sent the vine into exile. This was actually the, the context of Psalm 80, wasn't it? Uh, the Psalm 80 was written in exile. The vine has been uprooted. And, and, and God did what he said he would do in Isaiah 5. And this is why Psalm 80 closed with that prayer, right? The, the, they sort of have the picture of the, the, the people who are part of this vine crying out to the Lord and praying these words. You could turn back there if you want. It's, the words are printed in your bulletin, so you don't need to go too far. But I want to read for you again verses 14 through 18 of Psalm 80 with the words of Jesus in John 15 in mind. Listen to this prayer. Turn again, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted, and for the son whom you made strong for yourself. They have burned it with fire. They have cut it down. May they perish at the rebuke of your face, but let your hand be on the man of your right hand, the Son of Man, whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call upon your name. Those words were written hundreds of years after, before Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, the shoot from the stump of Jesse, came into the world. Have regard for the Son of Man, the man of your right hand. Then we will have life, and we will not turn back from you. And Jesus, just before he gives his life for his people, says these words, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. And so you see, how would a first century Jew, hearing Jesus say these words, how, how, would, how would you, if you're in that context, you've been waiting for this, this deliverance to come, how would you have heard those words of Jesus? It's not just a nice metaphor, right? What is Jesus saying? He is saying, I am the fulfillment of everything that God has been doing from the very beginning. I am the true vine who gives life to the branches. In other words, I am the answer to Psalm 80. I am the vine. I will be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. I am the seed of Abraham through whom the nations of the world will be blessed. I am the shoot out of the stump of Jesse who will spread out and cover the earth and bring blessing to the nations. I am saying these things so that your joy may be full. Does that give you joy today? Does that give you joy today? I mean, there is nothing more joyful and nothing more, more worth rejoicing in in all of the universe than to know that in Jesus Christ is life and that that life is in you. Amen? So, Jesus is the vine. He has been taken up and he has been planted with the Father, his vine dresser, not in an earthly promised land, not in an earthly land that only gives temporary things, but in the heavenly, eternal promised land. And just like a vine takes nutrients from the soil that it's planted in and gives life to the branches that bear fruit, Jesus takes that heavenly life, pours out his Holy Spirit, and gives fruit to the to, gives life to the branches that that are in him. And so Jesus is saying, right, this is, I am the fulfillment of God's purpose, purposes for humanity. I am the fulfillment of God's purposes for Israel. I am the fulfillment of God's purposes for you, my apostles in the first century. I am the fulfillment of God's purposes for you, Calvary Presbyterian Church, 21st century Willow Grove, Pennsylvania. I am saying these things that your joy may be full. Okay, sounds great. That's the vine and the vine dresser. What about the branches? This is where things start to get a little messy, isn't it? When you start talking about the branches. Verse 2, every branch in me, Jesus says, that doesn't bear fruit, he, my father, 
takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Note well, the Father doesn't have to do anything to the vine, <laughs> right? The vine is perfect. The vine doesn't need any work. The, the only things that need work are the branches. So we have here the dead branches and the living branches. We have the unfruitful branches and the fruitful branches. And the vine dresser, what does the vine dresser do? He cuts. He cuts. The, the unfruitful branches he cuts off. The fruitful branches he prunes, cuts. Either way, you're getting cut. The only, the, only, uh, the only thing is, why are you getting cut and how thoroughly are you getting cut? So what's up with these, these, fruitful, these unfruitful branches? Sort of scary, isn't it? Uh, Jesus says, verse 2, Every branch in me that, I, that doesn't bear fruit, my father, my father takes away. Verse 6, he goes further. He says, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Now, that's not a very pleasant thought, is it? And so if you, you, know, if you spend any time in the past in John chapter, chapter 15, you've inevitably asked the question, haven't you, well, am I, am I one of those branches that's going to be gathered and thrown into the fire and burned? But remember, beloved, Jesus didn't give these words to you to scare you. That your joy may be full. That's why these words are here. And so here's what you need to see. Notice, there is one major difference between these two types of branches. And that is this. The unfruitful branches do not abide in the vine. The fruitful branches abide in the vine. The unfruitful branches, Jesus says, are in the vine in some way, but they are never said at any time to abide in the vine. Now, what does it mean to abide in something? It's to stay there. It's to remain there. It's to live there. Your home, right, is called your abode. Why? Because it's where you abide. Uh, and so, the unfruitful branches, you see, are those who are associated with this vine in some way, but they are not abiding in the vine in a relationship of love, right? This is why Jesus says in verse 9, abide in my love, right? They are not related to the vine in this relationship of living, vital union. And so Jesus actually, you need to see, gives us a glimpse into the sort of people that he's talking about in verse 3 when he says this, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. And that points us back to chapter 13, verse 10. Remember what Jesus said back in 13, verse 10, while he was washing their feet. You are clean, but not every one of you. Who was the not every one of you? Judas. Here, note that when Jesus is talking about the branches and the vine, he doesn't say not every one of you. He just says, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Right Of the, of the 12 apostles, 11 were abiding in the vine. One was not. Right, Judas outwardly kind of looked like the other branches, right? Uh, went around, uh, followed Jesus, taught about Jesus, uh, even seemed to care about other people, even performed miracles with the other, the other apostles. But when you looked at, the, at, at Judas's life, it was just a nice, shiny bowl of plastic imitation fruit. It looked great from a distance, and even might have looked shinier than a lot of the other branches. But when you got close enough and you picked up one of those pieces of fruit, you realized this is just fake. It's just surface level. Why? Because it did not come from a heart of vital, uniting love with Jesus. It did not come from, from a heart that has been penetrated by the love of Christ, but from a dirty factory uh, that, that just produces fake, manufactured things. That was Judas. And so, uh, this, is, this, is the, this is what these branches that Jesus are talking about, who don't bear fruit, are like. You may, you may be a member of the church, you may look really good on the outside. You may, your outward actions may look just like a lot of other branches that are actually abiding in the vine. But when it really comes down to it, the, the things that you're doing are externally manufactured. 
They don't come from, from the love of Jesus that has penetrated into your heart. And so you need to ask that question. Uh, where am I in this picture? Ha has the love of Jesus actually entered into me and changed me, and is it producing fruit in my life? Not perfect fruit, because what are the other branches? They're like Peter and the other apostles, right? Branches that need a whole lot of work, <laughs> right? And that's really, you know, Christians are, are not people who think that we have it all together, right? We're actually people who just realize what Jesus says in verse 5 at the end there, apart from me, you can do nothing, right? The fruitful branches are not branches that are perfect. They're branches that realize that apart from Jesus, we have no hope. And so Peter, the apostles, right, you know, they fail, they struggle, they sin, they say really dumb things like denying Jesus, John chapter 18. They do really stupid things like cutting off a guy's ear, again, Peter, John chapter 18. And there is only one difference, they receive life from the vine. Why? Because they're so great, so spiritual, so wonderful, so beautiful, so pretty. No, because Jesus is, and he is the vine. And his father is the vine dresser. And so, picking up in the middle of verse 2, I promise I'm going to pick up the pace here. Don't get demoralized thinking we're only in verse 2. Pastor John's been talking way too long already. We're picking up the pace. All right? Uh, so, picking up at verse 2, every branch that does not bear fruit, that does bear fruit, my father prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Here's what you need to see, beloved. God is on a mission in your life for your fruitfulness. God is on a mission in your life for your fruitfulness. Yes, he cares about things like your material needs. Not a hair will fall from your head apart from the will of your heavenly Father. He cares about things like your job. He cares about things like your health. He cares about those things. But those things are not his priority for you. Because those things are temporary. There is only one thing that will last, and that is the life of Jesus that is in you. That is God's priority in your life. How does God accomplish this mission? He prunes. He prunes. What is pruning now? Right, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert horticulturalist by any stretch of the imagination. Ask Yvonne, she'll tell you. It's, I'm hopeless. Uh, but I do at least know this. What is pruning? Pruning is when you cut what is overgrown or dead from branches so that they can become more fruitful, so that they can increase their production. And, if, if, and, and in your life as a branch, you need to see that there are two types of dead and overgrown things in your life that the Father prunes. Two types of things. External things and internal things. External and internal. These are the two threats that the branches face. What are the external threats? The external threats are anything in the world, uh, in your surroundings, that you might look to and say, I have fulfillment, I have happiness, I have contentment, if I have that. That's the external threat. That is the overgrown stuff, right? You know, and, and it can be good, good things, house, car, job, family, marriage, success, all of these things. These are like little vines that spring up from the earth. But they're not heavenly vines. They're not things that give eternal life. They, they may be good insofar as, as, as they're meant to, to be something, a blessing of God in your life, but they don't give you what you really need for lasting joy and contentment in life. Right? And so, um, if, you're, if you're a branch, you need to see the, the thing right, that, that, that you need more than anything else is the vine. And so God works in your life to draw, drive you back again and again, away from trusting in all of those other things to the vine. I shared on Friday morning an experience that I had in my life uh, where I was talking about the, uh, talk with the, uh, the men at the 
uh, fr Friday morning men's breakfast at Panera, and I shared about this time in my life early on in my walk with the Lord, where the Lord took something out of my life that I that I and my thought my motivations were really good with this thing, and the Lord took this thing away, and it was devastating to me. It was utterly devastating, and I wept, and I couldn't eat for days, and I asked, why, God, did you do this? Why are you doing this? Now, hindsight, that was like the best thing, one of the best things that ever happened to me. Because through that, I saw, right after the initial shock, all of this stuff in my heart that was overgrown, trusting in other things, not abiding in the vine, seeking my happiness in this thing that God took away from me. And I wasn't at a place in my life that I could handle that thing. And so when you think about your life, right, and you think about all the stuff that's going on in your life, in your life, you need to see the loving hands of your Father carefully pruning and watching and waiting right? That's what God is doing. Whatever you might be going through today, whatever that circumstance might be, and you think, why is the Lord doing this? That's his purpose for your fruitfulness. And why is he doing this? The end of verse 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. Not apart from me, right? You may have a chance to do something or other. <laughs> no, apart from me, you can do nothing. No fruit, no life apart from Jesus, which brings me then to the internal threat of your fruitfulness, which is pride, which is self-sufficiency, thinking that you have life in yourself. You see, if you're a fruitful branch, if, if, if you know, things are going well, uh, if you're experiencing the love of Jesus, if you're, uh, if you're sharing the gospel with people, you may even be, be seeing people get saved and, 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 all, and great things happening. What is the biggest threat to your ongoing fruitfulness? It is that you start thinking that you are the vine. You forget that you're just a branch. And, and you know, what would happen if, if a branch, you know, a little old branch hanging off the vine we're to one day say, hey, I'm doing really good. Look at all this fruit. Maybe, I, maybe I'm the vine. And start, and start seek, seeking within itself the resources for its ongoing life. It will wither and die. And that's what happens to us if we are trusting in ourselves and not drawing life from the vine. And so you, you see the Father is at, is at work in your life, not only to, to, to break your, your uh, reliance upon external things, but also to cut away this innate tendency that you have to, to, see, to seek life within yourself, uh, to think that you have it figured out, to think that you can do it on your own. 2 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul talks about this when he, when he talks about this thorn that he had in the flesh that he pled with the Lord three times to take away from him. And what was the Lord's answer to him every time? My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. It's a picture of this pruning process. God at work in his providence in your life to bring the in, internal change that will produce eternal fruit. And so here's a lesson that I've learned in my life that I want to pass on to you. You might think I'm a little crazy, but how many of you guys know what it's like to experience a dry season spiritually in your life? I think everybody's hand should be up, right? We all know that. Go to a prayer meeting, ask for prayer requests. At least somebody's going to say, I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing a dry season spiritually. And why do those things happen? You know, the Lord has brought me to a place in my life where I can even give thanks sometimes in a sort of half-hearted way <laughs> for the dry seasons. Because you need to see God has a purpose even in those dry seasons. And what is that purpose? Apart from me, you can do nothing. The purpose is to drive you back again and again to the, to the vine. And the purpose is so that you won't start to feel like you're self-sufficient when he lets you experience something of how dry you really are apart from Jesus. He is directing you again and again to the source of life. Because you need to see grace in your life is not feeling good. 
I think that that's one of the big misconceptions that we have about grace. It's not feeling good. Grace is Jesus. And insofar as you're holding on to him, you are, you are receiving grace. Whether you feel it or not. Whether you're depressed or just think everything's wonderful. If you are holding on to Christ, you have grace. So the fruit. I'm going to just breeze through this real quick, I promise. The fruit. Uh, Galatians 5, right? Uh, Paul talks about the nine fruits of the Spirit. Who can rattle them off? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I have them written here so I wouldn't forget. Um, no coincidence. Jesus explicitly talks about the first two in this passage. Love and joy. The third, by the way, was last week in chapter 14, peace. Uh, and so, listen to these words as we wrap up. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. Oh, what? Any more blessed words to hear than that Jesus saying, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Love and joy. Here's what I want to leave you with. You need to understand cultivating in your life the fruit of love and joy is a lifelong process. It is a lifelong process. You know, part of our problem when we think about what it means to grow in the Christian life is that we have like a, an espresso shot conception of growth. Like, you know, you, you take the shot, it's supposed to work immediately, you go your merry way, and what happens? You fizzle out. We think that grace, we think that growth should come like that. That's not how it works. That's never how the Bible talks about growth in your life. You need to see growth in your life is like planting a vineyard. I am the vine, you are the branches. Did you know that if you want to plant a vineyard, you take a vine, you take all those vines, you plant them in the ground, you tend to them. Do you know how long it takes for a vineyard to start producing fruit? Three to four years. Three to four years. Year after year, day after day, week after week, month after month, pruning, digging, watering, watching, waiting. That is what growth in your life is like. There's a whole lot of watering and pruning and waiting. And so you need to see, when you look at your life, and I know that some of you here today need to hear this, when you look at your life just, ab just according to the day-to-day, -day, right, comparing one day to the next, you will automatically either get discouraged or overconfident. You will either be discouraged or overconfident. Why? Because either you'll say, today I look just the same way as I did yesterday. So am I really abiding in the vine? Is God at work in my life? Do I have anything? Am I, am I just one of those dry, dead up branches that's going to be gathered up, into the, uh, gathered up and burned? Discouragement. Or you'll say, hey, <laughs> look, how, look how good I'm doing. I, I feel so much better today than yesterday. There's change happening. And then what happens when the next day is actually worse than the day before? Overconfidence. What is the only way to guard yourself as a branch from either discouragement on the one hand or overconfidence on the other? I am tr the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. The only way is to take your eyes off of yourself, off of all the stuff that's going, going on around you, off of all the things that scare you, and place them on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it is only in Him that you have life. You are a branch. 
the branch doesn't have life in itself. The branch doesn't have life from its environment. The branch has life from the vine. Believe that, beloved. And then bear fruit and bless the other branches. Because, because you need to see God, the vine dresser, has placed you where you are in your life, in the world, and at this time, so that you can shine with his life, so that you can bear fruit and bring his blessing, the blessing of his love and his joy to the people around you in your workplace, in your family, in your neighborhood. That is why you are here, to bear fruit to the glory of his name. Let's pray. Lord, we, I confess that so often I seek life in other things whatever it might be. And I know that that's the case for your people because that's just the natural bent of our hearts. We seek fulfillment, comfort, peace, joy, happiness, and so much stuff other than you. And I try to muster up in my, within myself the strength to get by. Lord Jesus, living vine, Father, heavenly vine dresser, Holy Spirit, life of the risen Christ within us, help us, O Lord, that we may bear fruit for you. In Jesus' name, amen.